Hi, working preachers. This is Caroline Lewis. I wanted to take a minute to let you know that our fall fundraising campaign is officially underway. I hope you're able to join us throughout the month of October as we come together to celebrate the ways our generous working preacher donors walk alongside each and every one of us by ensuring Working Preacher remains a free resource available to all who need it. Every gift counts towards helping us reach our goal of raising $50,000 to continue supporting preachers like you with the quality content you rely on week after week. Working Preacher would not be possible without your support, and the entire Sermon Brainwave team is incredibly thankful for each and every one of you. Your support to Working Preacher reminds me that we are making a difference and that this site matters to you. Go to workingpreacher.org to participate in the fall campaign before October 31st. Thank you for your support and making this ministry possible. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. The text for the 20th Sunday after Pentecost, which falls on October 6, 2024, are from Genesis chapter 2, 18 through 24. Our alternate first reading is Job 1, 1, and then 2, 1 through 10. Psalm 8, we begin a series in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, and then 2, 5 through 12. And our gospel reading for today is Mark 10, 2 through 16. So this Sunday is a rough one, uh, fellow Sermon Brainwave co-hosts and preachers out there. I just want to name that at the beginning because uh, we have two challenging texts, Mark the Mark 10 text and the Genesis text. And then we also begin a four-part series in the book of Job and a seven-part series in the book of Hebrews. So this is, uh, hopefully, everybody's listening to this early on because there are a lot of lot of things to navigate, I think, this week. I mean, obviously, making a decision as to whether or not you want to perhaps move through Job or move through Hebrews, but uh, particularly also Mark 10 and Genesis 2, that pairing. But as the commentary says for Mark 10, 2 through 16, the very first words are beware this week. <laughs> and, uh, and as soon as you read the word divorce aloud, a whole sermon will appear in people's heads. And I really appreciated that opening line because that states it. Uh, just spot on that this is a uh, this is a text that requires an extraordinary amount of pastoral care on the part of the preacher to uh, to work through this text knowing the knowing the multiple contexts of their of their listeners so I'm just naming naming the obvious but it's worth worth stating there's almost no safe place to go this week. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and everything's going to require some teaching in the midst mm -hmm. of the preaching, contextualizing passages that people might have heard but not really studied, or might have been used against them in some way. And that's true whether it's you know Job or Hebrews as well. You're talking about two of the more challenging books in the Bible in terms of helping people get their heads around what's going on in this in this book. So, I guess we start with Mark 10, which is our practice. Right. And I'll, and I'll say behind you, Caroline, uh, in this recognition, I too appreciated that uh, comment in the commentary. And um, what I would uh, uh, what I would uh, invite our listeners to consider is what you're saying, Matt. Put this in the context that this is the Pharisees testing Jesus. So we like to ask questions of the text that answer our life moment crisis, but we're in the ongoing narrative of who Jesus is, as Mark is telling us. And so um, setting that uh, context, 
may be one way to get folks to, okay, maybe this isn't the sermon I heard from the pulpit or from my uncle, you know? Yeah, so a, a couple of things, right? Like, like you know, Joy, it's um, it's the conversation does not begin in good faith, uh, which happens occasionally in the Gospels. And so that's an interesting <laughs> signal that already that there's something going on behind the scenes. And so that would explain why there's more than just a, 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 a spirited debate going on here um, around a topic that Jews are debating pretty widely in the first century as as best we can tell uh and not all in the same way uh in fact it's not even clear that these are pharisees and and our nrsv updated edition removes them it's just some so we're not even really sure exactly who they are i would say too it's also this is under the banner under the canopy still of die yourself take up your cross and follow me mm-hmm. i think everything is up until the bartimaeus story at the end of, of chapter 10 and so one of the things that's going on in this story, and Phil uh, Ruggie Jones mentions this in his third paragraph, still caring for the vulnerable or the heading there, that this is in the context of Jesus, who is worried about people exploiting the vulnerabilities of others, people taking advantage of others. And he's talked about that with regard to children. He's going to talk about it in future weeks with regard to power and positions of authority. And some of that's going on in this story as well. Yeah, and I think too the uh, again the recognition you already named this Matt, but this this Sunday and then the next four Sundays are all of chapter ten of the Gospel of Mark, with eleven being the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. So that that sort of narrative space or that narrative place is also heightening right the uh the importance or the what's at stake with these with this dialogue uh between these leaders or these authorities and Jesus and uh and particularly in the context of the you know we'll get the third pa- well actually we don't get the third passion prediction in the lectionary but it exists in this chapter and so it's all surrounded by what does uh, what does this life look like? And it's a cause for this life of following Jesus and following him on the way, which is which was what what blind Bartimaeus, you know, Bartimaeus will do. But it's in this context of uh, what does it, what does life look like uh, in following Jesus, and who are we paying attention to, and who are we, uh, who are we including in this, and. Where is it that uh, where is it that practices and ways of being, particularly within the context of uh, a, a colonized Palestine, uh, what does that what does that mean then for how, what the kingdom of God looks like? And I think that's another larger framework here uh, that, that there's a recasting of of what uh, of societal expectations of of how we navigate relationships, uh, both personally and corporately. And so it's, it's, yeah, it's zeroing in on this particular, uh, this, this, you know, the issue of divorce, but it also, you know, to put it in that also wider context, I think is important. I was going to tell a brief story about, about this passage, if that's all yeah. right. Um, and I've I've written commentary on Working Preacher in years past on this. It's largely an explaining kind of commentary. And I was mm-hmm. this was actually on 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 the retreat that the three of us hosted back in late July, early August in Ghost Ranch, New Mexico. And we're going again in 2025. Uh, but the um, I was in a text study small group about this, and we spent a lot of time on this text. And I realized I had spent a good amount of time again trying to explain ancient customs around divorce, what Jesus, who Jesus is talking to and why and how this matters for thinking about Genesis. And it was a lot of explaining and because people have a lot of questions, but embedded in that was kind of a, this is a passage to fix. And afterwards, somebody came up to me and very politely pointed out that this story is about more than just uh, heterosexual couples navigating marriage and said, you need to remember that the gay community has found ways to navigate relationships, committed relationships, when marriage was not an option for them. And that led to a more interesting conversation about things like, as have 
single people have, have all other kinds of ways of people creating families. And so it's easy to get drawn into this and make this a story about husbands and wives and children that's kind of under the umbrella of what society says marriage is supposed to look like. And so it was this interesting conversation that made me, in a way, kind of repent for my own way of thinking about, this is a passage that takes us into questions of what does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be in relationship? What does it mean to be in love? What does it mean to have a family and raise a family? And what's the norm, right? And so one of the traps, I think, if we get into an explanatory mode with this passage is it becomes really easy to say, Marriage is God's ideal for all individuals, and therefore single people, if something's defective, it's easy to get to the point where you might say not having children is God's ideal, and therefore something is defective if you don't have children. Do you know what I mean? It's easy to understand marriage as an institution or as a set of relationships or as a legal category that has changed a lot throughout societies and throughout history. And so, which all gets back to the question, right, of how do we live together well in ways that respect individual choices, gifts, circumstances? Um, and how does the church steward all of those relationships, all of those ways of being in the world? And so I know that's not what the text is about, but <laughs> it does raise the question of why do people get married in the first place? Why did they get married in the first place? Why? What kind of relationship do you understand that to be and to whom is it open? Those kinds of questions I think the sermon makes a mistake if it doesn't open it up to those deeper questions, as opposed to getting stuck on what did Jesus permit, what did Jesus forbid, and why. Sorry, that's a really long response. I will now stay yeah. silent while the two of you correct no, me or whatever. Good. But it's no, really helpful. No. It's 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 very real. It's where people are. It's uh, the questions that people are bringing to the text, and um, in many ways, it's very interesting because that's exactly what's happening here. Um, Mark is um, uh, revealing who Jesus is through acts and through encounters and uh, through teaching. And the Pharisees or whoever it is that are bringing these questions um, are trying to trap him. They're coming uh, with uh, a lacking integrity of wanting to accept him. And so that they're using the customs of the land and um, trying to say, well, this is what we do. And where do you fall in there? And this is going to come up again. Uh, you know, who do you pay taxes to? But there's the um there's the tendency for us to do the very same thing to spend so much time talking about um arguing about uh what is the custom this month or in this state or in my uh culture or in my home and we miss what is it that brings order where there are less people identified as vulnerable where there are less people who are ignored or marginalized, um, or to put that in the positive, where there are more people that can actually encounter the life-giving promise, life-giving ongoing promises of the presence of God. And this is a text that we emulate, not Jesus, but we emulate those who are testing Jesus. So if you know if it, if if it fell to me to preach on October sixth, I would I would probably do a sermon about marriage in terms of and just kind of healthy relationships and what does that look like again in different cultural settings, which even in twenty twenty four are different around the world depending upon where you live and and questions like that. And then to ask the question of why would Jesus care? <laughs> he obviously does, and why should the church care? And how does the church support families, communities? couples, relationships, you know, and what is the church's role in that? Even to spend a little bit of time to ask the question, why does the church bless marriages, conduct marriages, and how are we cooperating with the state in doing so in some ways, but also not, right? So what makes it different? And just to explore that a little bit, and suddenly people will start, I think, start to say, oh, we can't get at this as just a what's permitted, what's not, or who's a sinner and who's not, but rather 
how can the church be more about <laughs> uh, the, this kind of kingdom work, right, of um, promoting healthy, I'll just use the word households, right, and what that might what that might look like. Because um, there's just so many traps here, right? Even the, you know, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. And, and the Genesis 2 text will introduce gender categories here. There's just all sorts of things that are going to, like, raise flags in a lot of people's minds and say, I don't navigate the world like that, or I've been hurt by narrow thinking around this. Which isn't to say that Jesus doesn't care. It's to say the church has got to find ways to talk about this in um, in life, getting giving ways that are true to the larger message of the gospel, which I think I keep saying over and over again. But that now I'll really so stop. Important. Yeah, right. That is so important, uh, though, Matt, because... Um, I remember uh, sitting in a seminary class and talking about these texts and having a student stop me and say, you cannot use the Bible, these portions of the Bible, because they do reference gender. They do reference marriage. They do reference households. They do reference practices that our culture no longer accepts and therefore, you cannot use the Bible to speak to these. Wow. We get, to, we get to silence the creator of the universe and, the, and Jesus, God incarnate, because we disagree with that portion of the text, which isn't even addressing the questions we're bringing to the text. Oh, the arrogance. And that's why I say we're imitating the Pharisees here. Oh, the arrogance. Jesus is bringing hope and life to the people they have ignored in their power and prestige. And they're saying, how do we trap you in this little conversation? Oh, the arrogance. Mm -hmm. I would say one other thing, and then we should move on, is something that you said, Matt, that made me think of this is that, uh, you know, how what is a tactic to <laughs> an angle into this text that doesn't fall into all those traps that you named. Mm -hmm. And I think it, for me, it ends up being, how do my relationships imitate, not imitate, but how do they reflect the kind of, the kind of kingdom that Jesus is presenting? Uh, do I are my relationships representative of those commitments to uh, to what what Jesus has presented as as uh, inherent to the kingdom of God, and then that makes me think about all different kinds of relationships, right? Not only of, of a spouse, but uh, with your children, with your friends, with with other family members, uh, acquaintances, uh, to say that God cares about relationships and how we live with one another. And when do we, when, when is the kingdom of God kind of a litmus test for how we live those relationships out? And so that's, that's another maybe angle one could take um, to, to think about what difference does it make that Jesus is talking about this besides the fact that he's tested, but. Yeah. And I, and, and I, I find the pairing or the continuation of the lectionary to follow the way that this text is presented to us or preserved for us, where it moves from this conversation to them bringing the children. And Jesus says, you know, listen, learn, receive like a child, you know, and, and I'm going to stick with this being a part of Mark's exposure of who Jesus is, that, that that's real important to me because it, in a world that is losing a sense of, the possibility of a God who is good, who is faithful to keep a promise that the world can be better than what we experience right now. For me, saying that there is a God who is good, who is keeping God's promise that the world can be better than we're living right now is, is, is center for me. And to shift this and to continue this text to say, how does a child get this? Or how much of our um, opinions and how much do we have to, um, how much do we have to teach a child that is what they wouldn't naturally understand uh, 
to get them to um, receive what is our cultural norm. And if this is about trusting God, children seem to be able to discern between the places of where we're talking about some fantasy and what we're saying, there is a God who loves me and who's created me in the divine image and given me the potential to bear the imprint of God's presence. And that's kind of simple. Yeah, it's important that we not neglect those last couple of verses, which might feel tacked on to some because the the, the issue of divorce and marriage and remarriage becomes so so paramount, so which again, I think that's where the commentary by Phil Ruggie Jones is really helpful yeah. about yeah. thinking about who's vulnerable and then even naming, right? In some cases, divorce saves people's lives and saves the lives of yes. children and people like that. And so yes. yeah. the, the way it's, it's a reminder that this is not an all or one kind of story, or it's really anybody who's done an ounce of pastoral care, right, knows that uh, no two marriages are exactly the like, alike, no two divorces are exactly the like, alike. And um, the, the church's calling is about more than just saying acceptable, unacceptable, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, there's really no time for Genesis 2, so you're going to have to do that all on your own. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> All right, maybe yeah. not. We'll, we'll squeeze it in. Well, I, yeah, I think Genesis 2, it's a, it's a helpful and not helpful pairing uh, with the Mark text. But mm -hmm. one of the things that, that I appreciated about the commentary is, is uh, particularly naming that not being alone is intrinsic to our well being. Yes. And, uh, and, uh, and I was, I was really intrigued by that, especially with regard to, uh, the commentator asked us to think about how this narrative leads us into pondering current issues of loneliness and isolation, which I keep hearing over and over and over again, you know, listening to different you know, shows on NPR or something like that and, and tackling the, this, um, particularly post pandemic of of ongoing feelings of of isolationism and loneliness, and that uh, that naming uh, naming that might be a really important again pastoral move this week uh, to say that that uh, and the and the way in which um, the way in which these a relationship. Uh, whatever that relationship is, is how how much we need that. That's essential for what it means to be human, is to be in relationship. And uh, and so I, I I I do wonder about that too, especially if people are feeling having those kinds of feelings, and yet this is what you know this is what one of the promises of this text. Yeah, here in the United States, right about a year ago, it was the the Surgeon General, you know, our chief medical officer in the government, um, talked about isolation as as an epidemic in this country, and that might be worth going back and reading some of the material around mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. uh, as well, because, like you said, Kelly, gets into the question: What does it mean to be human? Uh, the Psalm helps us with that mm -hmm. uh, as well, and. Um, this text at least provokes that question as well as, as Mark 10. And again, the commentary is great in terms of helping us avoid too quickly gendering the text as if it's, you know, a fully formed man who needs now a fully formed woman to be a subordinate, you know, all those traditional ways of reading it and, and to play around with that word helper and to understand what's going on here in terms of it's a solitary human being who now finds another human being is, is a better way into it. But of course, there's a lot of, of unteaching that has to happen around this text and for many people yes. too, isn't there? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Or de-teaching or whatever we're going to call it. <laughs> yeah. 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 I find uh, enter entering into this text around uh, this idea that it is not good for the human um, rather than man. Uh, it is not good for the human to be alone um, to be key. And uh, Matt, as you're saying, um, uh, to do some recognition of this idea of helper, uh, the language that is used in other places to reference God, and therefore um, 
not putting the man, in this point I am gendering, above God because helper would be subordinate. I think not if we're, if we're reading it more fully. And uh, one of the interpretations that really struck out for me um, that is that this naming of all of the animals basically distinguishes what would be the proper helper, uh, the proper partner is the word I want to use, um, is not a beast, is not a beast of the field, but that, that the creature that God forms in the divine image uh, is an equal partner, uh, not my pet dog or my pet fish or my kitty cat, um, but another human imprinted as the image of God equally. And uh, so, so to, to look at that text with that idea in it and then to see the equality uh, that is there, uh, be, as you said, Matt, requires changing some of the ways that we've approached that text and then ultimately uh, just understanding uh, the importance, uh, Caroline, as you turned us to, of what it means to be in relationship and in community when it seems like we can do so much on our own, all alone, so long as we have the right digital devices. <laughs> yeah, I think the dog probably came close. Yeah. I think it took a few days before they're like, well, oh, the dog could... <laughs> Could work. I, I I think I would have lingered there maybe a week. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Can we talk about Psalm eight next? Just because I think the I, I think the, this idea of what does it mean to be human and what is human. what is what is uh, what's what is good living look like for a human being is is implied in Psalm eight. Mm -hmm. um, what does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be cared for by God? To have God concerned about your well being. As yeah. opposed Notice, to an yeah. angry judge who wants to smite you for doing the wrong thing, but a God who's trying to promote good living yeah. Yeah. <laughs> among humanity. Yeah. I mean, just that that verse four, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them as a larger sort of lens through which to view these these two texts that we've already talked about. That when that God's care for or God's mindfulness of human beings is the totality of our human experience, and uh, and how God God's self needs to be in relationship, uh, that that God actively sought that out. <laughs> God doesn't want to be alone, um, and uh, and and. And the, the challenges, right, of maintaining a good relationship, my goodness, God had to work really hard at that. God continues to work and God, really hard at And this. God continues to do that. But I think that, I think using that phrase from Psalm 8 could also be really helpful that when we think about God's, you know, caring for us, uh, it is also from that place where uh, God, God's very self, is uh, doesn't want to be lonely, and that and knowing, uh, knowing the totality of human experience and wanting to enter into that and uh, and paying attention to that, I think is um, could be a could be an you know overview of or a, like I said, a lens through which to talk about the other texts as well. There's also, uh, and and I agree, um, I'll even reference back when we hit uh, uh, the Hebrews and Job, but um, also going back to Mark, uh, that ending of Mark that uh, I don't want tacked on or removed, um, just the fact that verse 2 references the mouths of babes and infants. You know, here we are again, that the child is, uh, it's not just the adult, uh, that God is interested in. It is the whole of who we are uh, in the entirety of our existence. And God uses us to be a glimpse of God's glory in that, in our full of life, fullness of life. Should we go to Job? Yeah, especially since Let's it might negate everything we just said about how good God is to humanity. 
<laughs> well, there's that. I, uh, yeah, so we've got seven weeks on Job. No, four, four, four weeks on Job. Four seven, on, Job. Seven, seven on Seven on Hebrews, Hebrews. Four on Job. And I, a couple of things here. One, I, I, this is sort of obvious, but the, you know, as the commentary uh, uh, points out, we have to sit, well, we don't have to, we only have to sit with this four weeks, but for Job, we are asked to sit with his unjust suffering for the next 40 some chapters, right? 40 chapters. And I, I think that's significant in and of itself. That isn't that also how suffering feels, mm -hmm. you know, that it, that, that the, that the length of this, the amount of chapters on, on this unjust suffering and why God and navigating, re-navigating a relationship with God and expectations of God is, is, is what we feel often uh, in that suffering. I was reminded of, um, <laughs> this is not really the same thing, but like when Holly asked, Holly McLean asked John and John McLean in, in the Die Hard 2, John, why does this keep happening to us? Uh, <laughs> but uh, Somebody uh, can work that in. That's, somebody, that's, why does this keep happening? Why does this keep happening? But it, it's really kind of a uh it's it's really it's an important narrative point to say how how just seriously how many chapters are devoted to this of sitting in this space and uh what difference does that make and how how does that even affirm how suffering feels um and particularly suffering that you that as a that you're questioning at the hand of god and that there are no, we just got through talking about it's not good to be alone, except for his friends in this case were no help at all. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's, I think you, um, to get people ready for what's going to come, <laughs> maybe you map out the book briefly and tell them where we're going to drop in in these four Sundays, but also to help people get ready for the ambiguity. Like there's not going to be an answer at the end that's going to there's no Make easy way out. Everything palatable. Exactly. Even Job's wife, verse nine, curse God and die can be translated, bless God and die. Like, you know what I mean? There's so much about this book where it's not exactly clear, clear. Uh, how to respond. And how, there's questions about how much Job is at peace with things. There's things here about who is the Satan person, what's going on, why would God allow this? So that to help people see it as a bit of a, of a fairy tale or a kind of a mythical story doesn't mean it's not serious, right? but to help people get inside of this, you might even want to read the, the jump ahead on the website and read the commentary by Esther Hamori on the very last of the four readings where she talks about her own response to the book as just being constantly Every time she's taken back into it, discovering something new and realizing how this old, weird, uncomfortable story still has the capacity to speak into the magnitude of mystery around God and the awfulness of human suffering. This idea of setting the larger framework of looking ahead, uh, especially if you're going to spend the four weeks here, which I think I might. If I were if I were preaching, I think I, I, I might... Uh, do that. Uh, a couple Good way to skip things. Mark 10, Joy. Uh, yeah, I wasn't going to say that out loud. Thank you for exposing me here, Matt. Uh, when you said uh, that that option earlier, I was like, yep, I wouldn't preach this. Now, now, now <laughs> Job is where I would go. Let me avoid this. Um, but a couple of things. Several years ago, I read uh, 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 the Bible through the year in what was said to be chronological order. And the way that they timed this one caused me to note what I hadn't noted before. And that is that um, this is not uh, about an Israelite, and it's not referencing anything that we know about the key people or key places 
are key events in the life of Israel. And so in this chronological uh, ordering, what the writers of that particular uh, one-year study did was to place this before the call of Abraham which began to get me to uh, thinking, and you've heard me talk about, you know, God loving all the world that is scattered in Genesis 11 by focusing on creating a nation through Abraham and Sarah's descendants that would be a blessing. Well, this is a story. This, let let me bring that back a little bit. This could be a story of those people in all of their philosophies about the justice of God, which we will get to as we have these four voices and the friends of Job responding. This is how um, that worldview, the ancient Near East worldview, would understand the justice of God. And the ambiguity is that that is never answered. Um, We do not get the answer that we would construct, um, which is actually the proposal that Job's friends make, that the world works this way and God has to work within that way. And that's not at all what happens here. And what does it mean for us to say, how do I step out of all of my preconceived ideas and allow this story to unfold and surprise, surprise what I'm going to say as a way to encounter the grandness and even the goodness of God. And in these verses that we have uh, this week, um, that identity of, of Job, uh, that identity of this not being a story from Israel, um, but also the identity of we say Satan, but the Satan, the accuser. And that's another thing. What if preaching this text allows listeners to say, when I think of Satan, I'm going to stop thinking about this evil being and begin to think of whatever it is that causes me to accuse God of being less than good less than faithful, less than trustworthy. For me, that sets this story up in an entirely different way because it causes me to say, I have to stop putting my assumptions into how God has to show up in this text. And then maybe I, like Job, can encounter a God I've never seen before. No extra charge for this podcast. We're going a little long today, but we still got to do Hebrews, friends. But that's actually a good segue. Mm -hmm. Um, joy into in, I mean, what you just said, I think it's a really good segue into Hebrews because that's how the book of Hebrews begins long ago. God spoke to our ancestors in many various ways by the prophets, but in these last days, God has spoken to us by a son. And so it, it, it states immediately that, you know, which, which is really what the whole New Testament is about, right? That mm-hmm. we we thought God, we <laughs> this is the way God approached us. This is the way God related with us. This is the way God spoke to us and talked to us. And now what? <laughs> you know, that the New Testament is like, okay, now God is doing this, and it's a it. I mean, that in and of itself, I think, is a great entry point into a book that is that is challenging for a lot of preachers because you get such different Christology yes. than we are used to. And, um, and yet that puts it into that larger context of the multiple Christologies that exist in the new Testament and how we are attentive to the particularity of those voices. And it, I think it also invites an interpretive act on the part of the listeners and the preachers to say, what does it mean that God now speaks to you through Jesus? Mm. How would you describe that? How would you articulate uh, your own, your own Christology um, with, and because that's what you really, that's so much of what you get in Hebrews is a, is a presentation of Jesus that is 
it doesn't doesn't immediately come to mind right. that Jesus is the high priest from the order of Melchizedek, not typically on the stained glass windows and all of that. So it, but it, I, I think that that's worth thinking about. And it's an interesting, um, a- another parallel in that is that Melchizedek is not of the order that um, the priests are supposed to be. And so this takes it again outside of that single reading of the text. And um, we're going to get, you know, that God has spoken to our ancestors in so many different ways. And now speaking to us through the sun and the sun is going to be lifted up above all of the prophets, above all of the priests, above all the other ways that God has spoken to us. And that recognition uh, an interesting thing becomes what is this order of Melchizedek uh, that we comes in? And for those who heard, um, I several times used the word imprint of God. Um, and I was I was thinking about Hebrews every time I used that in the previous text. <laughs> the, uh, the the f- there's a lot of fun things about the way Hebrews starts off the uh, the Christology the the way and later on we're going to talk about Jesus being made perfect and that complete mm-hmm. is a better way of understanding that and some of that completion comes about because of what we read in the first four verses here in terms of who Jesus is and that but what I like about it there's a way in which the, uh, this opening passage there's a way in which it speaks to one of the fundamental human or Christian dilemmas which is all of this talk about who Jesus is now one who has put everything in subjection right under under his feet right the way in which the the kind of jesus is lord description that's going on here (laughs) but then in verse eight we do not yet see everything in subjection to them but we do see jesus and so there's this interesting now but not yet dynamic to this that a preacher can really do some interesting things with, right? So what do we do with this high Christology? Well, we make these grandiose claims, but then it's like, but how come the news is still so terrible every day? But we do see Jesus, right? I mean, to kind of play with that as a refrain is I think homiletical gold. And the idea of the angels from um, Psalm 8 in chapter two, of that recognition uh, that, Jesus is above the angels, that humanity is just a little bit lower than, and God is mindful of us, and that mindfulness is shown in this Jesus. Sermon Brainwave is a production of Luther Seminary's Working Preacher. Working Preacher has been a trusted source of inspiration, interpretation, and imagination for preachers worldwide since 2007. Find episodes and links at workingpreacher.org slash brainwave. And be sure to rate, subscribe, and comment on YouTube. Thanks for joining us.